Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're listening to Identifying the Messiah. Here we are uh, this week here. The, uh, of course, we're in August, August the 18th today. And uh, amazing information I want to share with you. I'm going to really get more seriously into the identity of the Messiah, specifically looking at the, uh, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek. And uh, this has a lot to do with the information I'm going to share with you on this video here that's on YouTube, uh, the End Times Showdown, Israel versus Edom. And I'm only going to be using a little short section of this video. And basically what uh, Mr. Shapiro says in this video is he talks about uh, redemption and that the Gentiles do not get redemption until all Israel, both the house of Judah, the house of Israel, they have to come in first. It's kind of put as a future tense. Well, it's not just kind of. It is put as a future tense event. I used to think the same way. So look, I can't fault uh, Mr. Shapira for saying these things. I also thought at one point that that was a future fulfillment of Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, starting with verse 31, where it speaks about that new covenant that God will make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But it doesn't mean that we are to go underneath Talmudic rabbis of today. That would be contrary to what the promises are speaking of. That's why we're going to get into this message here. I think it'll be a blessing for you. Let's get right with it here. First, for those of you that are listening on Danoon Institute, let me play you this clip right here so you see exactly what I was saying verbally. And, uh, and then we're going to really get into the scriptures on this entire issue there. Let's, uh, well, let me make sure, too, we have a good audio. When Israel walking into the land, when Israel as a whole walking into the relationship and the new covenant with the God of Israel, then all of Israel will be complete and then our redemption will be complete as well. I know it's important to understand that, but hello, Jeremiah 31 says, Behold, I'm giving a new covenant to the house of Israel and to the house of Gentiles and Judah. He doesn't say, I have given it to the Gentiles. The nations need Israel. You need Messianic Judaism to succeed. You depend at Messianic Judaism and thriving. Yes, you do. I want you to know that, and I'm not saying in a prideful spirit, it is part of the package. The second the church wants to have their own journey that is separate from Israel's journey, that's when you're going to start to run into trouble, and that's exactly what you see in the Torah portion this week. In Parashat Matot, actually, the journey continuing one step closer to redemption. Finally, they're moving forward. But before they move forward, who is ready to move forward today? Who is ready to move forward? Let me try again. Who wants to get one step closer for the coming of Yeshua? We can take one step closer. But before we can take one step closer, we need to deal with the house. It's going to be challenges. You know, all of you say amen and hallelujah a few minutes ago. We are going to see that. Before they're moving again, we had a problem. We had God and we have Reuben and we have the half tribe of Menashe. Oh, yeah, sure. They are part of the house of Israel. But they thought for a second that their journey was over. Very important to listen. what I'm telling you. They came to a green pasture. They said, we are saved. We are redeemed. We found the promised land. We are entering in. But there is a word here to us to take. Nobody can enter in their point of rest until Israel go in first. Because Israel is the son of God. They are the firstborn. And unless Israel come in, in first, no Gentile in the world, in the universe, will have a complete salvation. Exclamation point. Period. Now, this is where things get real, real serious. 
Israel has to go in first, and no Gentile, his redemption can be complete until Israel goes in first. Now, in part, I agree um, with Rabbi Sh Shapira on that statement there, but the issue is, is Israel's already gone in. Uh, and this has a lot to do with the new covenant. And that new covenant is not only spoken about over in Jeremiah 31, but it's also spoken about in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 8. This is also where we find Melchizedek, and we're going to be getting into a lot of these things today. But before I do, uh, and I don't have this in the, in the order I was intending to bring this out, but I want to first share with you a very interesting scripture, and this is found in Genesis and you may wonder, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the enmity. But I think as I go on, you'll, you'll really begin to understand why I put this in there. It says here, this course is after the uh, serpent has already deceived Eve. And, uh, and, and keep in mind, the woman was deceived. She did not sin willfully. It was by deception that she fell. Adam, on the other hand, knew what was going on and he sinned willfully. That's what plunged us into, the, into death was because of the willful sin. All right. Now, it says here, though, when you get to verse 15, God says to, when he's speaking there, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. They shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise their heel now the word there and they is not in the hebrew hebrew language and again it's another one of these issues where i take uh i take an issue with the talmudic masoretic vowel pointing that was added into the scripture because it's just not accurate uh, if you look this up in the septuagint you will find out it the the heel the word there and heel is singular masculine so it should be as it is in the King James Bible his heel all right and like it says there they shall bruise thy head right they shall bruise thy head and uh, uh, and again uh, and uh, and thou shalt bruise their heel they put that vowel in there. It is actually found right here. They put the vowel at the end of the bob where it should be over the top of the bob because it is his heel. All right. And uh, now the word bruising, we could use that word bruising. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Bruise, injured, wounded. I know some people put in there that the head uh, of the serpent is crushed and the heel representing, of course, the woman's seed, which is Christ. That is true. Uh, but it's not the word crush as you can see here and I'm going to show this to you if I get the mouse here to work all right who right here here we go this is the bruising of the head all right he will bruise all right uh, the head and there again it's yashufcha everything is singular there's no they there anything like that not their head not as a plural it is a singular all right, but the word for that bruising or injury, you might say, is the root of that is actually shin vav fe. All right, same thing over there when it comes to the heel. Again, you, the tav in front, shufan, shufan no, should be a vav, the vav should have the dagish over the top, which would make it his heel, as we also see in the Septuagint. And uh, again, it's shuf. So you can't have one having a bruised he heel and the other one having a crushed head when we look at the, uh, the, the scripture here in the Hebrew itself. It just doesn't exist. So the injuries are the same. Where do we get the idea, though, of the crushed head? It's actually from Psalms, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit with you because it is the return of Christ when he comes back in judgment. But I wanted to start this off, though, and focus, though, my real focus here is the enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Okay? Uh, and that's where we really are wanting to look uh, at what's going on right here. And that is the word enmity. He's going to put this enmity between the two. Enmity meaning hatred. Right? Now, the hatred, as we're going to get into here in just a little bit, 
deals with the law. You'll be surprised. Let's start. I want to jump over here, and we're going to start here in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. Uh, and we're going to, of course, be reading a lot more even before that in chapter 8, as well as also in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews. But this is where we really want to look at. For if that first covenant, and of course the word covenant is in a text, so it's not actually the word covenant written there. So for, for if that first had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. All right, now we know it's speaking of the covenant or the law because of the fact we're going to get into this in a moment here. This is the entire premise that, uh, that the writer of the book of Hebrews is going to make here about that first covenant. All right, now let's back up to verse 1 here. I want to just kind of uh, read a little bit in here. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, we have uh, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. All right. You know what? Maybe I should wait on that just for a moment. We, 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 we established first that for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, a second covenant. Right. In other words, if the law that was given to Moses, both Levitical and the Ten Commandments, right? If that law uh, had been faultless, then should there should be no place have been sought for a second covenant. Now, scripturally, and bear with me, I know some of you right quickly are probably ready to jump off the boat. Oh my God, Steve is fixing to speak against the law. I'm only going to tell you what the scripture says. All right, and we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments because I one thing there's two two things you really need to understand here. Even before I go any further, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, where did He tell him to put those Ten Commandments? In the Ark. The Ten Commandments were placed in the Ark. All right, just like the New Covenant is to be written where in your heart. Where's your heart at? Inside your body. Okay, where was the ark placed at? In the Holy of Holies, in the temple. Inside the body. Christ is the body. We are members of his body. And therefore, that new covenant is to be written in your heart. Where was the Levitical law placed? It was placed outside the ark. Never in the ark. Never within your heart. That's why you're going to find in just a little bit how it's even spoken about that the law is enmity. Just hold on. All right. Father, give me grace to help get through this here. All right. Let's take a look also. Jeremiah 31. This is, uh, this is one of the places uh, where uh, Mr. Shapira speaks about. And, and, uh, and let me, uh, I should speak with speak a little bit more in, in, in a kinder way we should call him brother Shapira because after all he professes to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah so in respects as a brother even if we may differ with one another I think it's only uh, the courtesy to say that about someone but he speaks about going to um, uh, to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31 and that's where we are right now where the prophet Jeremiah says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their father. Wait a minute, let me back up. Verse 30. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. All right? A new covenant. All right? Now, I agree with Brother Shapira on the issue here. The covenant is made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It's not made with Gentiles. All right? But there's another thing, though, that we're not thinking about. Because, and, and Brother Shapiro is not the only one. There are many other ministers as well as rabbis today, both messianic, both non-messianic, but even in Hebrew Roots movement, we have the same issue that's going on, and that is trying to put the people underneath the law. 
In the case of the Messianic movement, and this is not all Messianic believers, so please, I know there's some really good Messianic people that love the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and no other way they would go, right? But the thing is, if the scripture here says the day is coming that he's going to make a new covenant, then why do you want to go underneath Levitical law? All right? A new covenant, as even it says in the book of Hebrews, makes the old covenant old. Right? But yet, in the day we're living in now, more people are trying to go up underneath the law, the keeping of the feast. And if you want to keep the feast for a ceremonial purpose and everything, there's nothing wrong with that. But I can prove to you in the scripture that Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, has fulfilled every single feast, including Yom Kippur, including uh, Sukkot. Every single feast has already been fulfilled. So, if you want to practice these things, you know, as we have communion, for example, uh, the believers in Yeshua have communion. That is the Passover. Now, some people would argue that, well, I better not get into that. Get into those issues there and people really flip out. But if you want to keep communion, you're keeping Passover. Yeshua said, do this as often as you do this. You do it in remembrance of me. I'll go ahead and say it anyway. Some people argue that even though it's not scriptural, that Yeshua actually, they, they sacrificed a lamb and they offered the lamb up during the Passover meal. I would have to tell you in one way, yes, in one way, no. Yes, he offered a lamb, but he was that Paschal lamb. That's why he said when he took the bread as a symbol and symbology and he broke it and he gave to him, he said, eat, this is my body. And then he took the wine and he said, drink of this cup or the grape juice. And he says, whichever one you believe that is. And he gives it to him and he says, drink that this is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant. Right? He was the Lamb of God. Had he taken, as it was done traditionally amongst all the Jewish families there, and had killed a lamb, then he would have actually spoke against what he came there for. Because he'd already told his apostles that he was going to be offered up for the sins of the world. Not only was he the Lamb of God for Passover, but he was also the Lamb the, for what? The sins of the world. When does that take place? Yom Kippur. When the priest was to take, he had the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat, and he offered one and set the other free, and Christ played both parts. On the sacrificial goat, he was the sacrifice for Israel for their sins. Not just for the year, but as a mediator between man and God for, the, for all eternity. From that, or from that point on, I shouldn't say eternity, for, the, for Olam, for the continuing on, from that point on. Else otherwise, there's no forgiveness of sins. Because God had a law on how that had to be done. And unless that law was fulfilled there, it's a, it's a perpetual. Well, he is a perpetual fulfillment of that law. All right? Now, in the case of the scapegoat, he also, like Joseph, bore in his body the sins of his brothers. Joseph, if you recall, his brethren lied to their father. They said to his father, and, they, and remember, they, they, they sacrificed a goat as well, and they put the blood on the goat. Well, that was, the, that was the, the blood of that goat is what God recognized as a sin offering. They, may, they didn't mean it that way. They meant it to cover up their tracks. But it did them no good until they really repented, right? 
And then in the case of Joseph, Joseph bore the wounds in his body of the sins of his brethren. And he bore it very far away, just like the scapegoat that's released out into the wilderness. Okay? And there's not any place that I know of that Joseph ever went and told his father what they did. You see, Yeshua, the same thing. His own brethren, he was sent to his own and his own received him not. Same thing with Joseph. You guys know the story. And even like with Joseph, they come down and, you know, it's interesting. They put their, you know, when Joseph sends them back, first he accuses them of spies and everything. Puts their money back in their bag, sends them back. Oh, they're freaking out. And you notice, so the first place they ever discovered their money, where was it? Chris, my brother, you in Israel, I know you listen to this broadcast. Listen up, brother. You know where that money was found at? Of course, it was in their sack, but you know where they were, where they were at when they found it? They were at the hotel. It says it in Hebrew, Bemalon, at the hotel. Or the inn, as you have in King James. Hebrews Bamalon. They were at the hotel when they when they spied the money in his bag. He was going to feed. He was in the stable part. He was going to feed uh, his animal there when he found his money in the bag. One of the brothers, I forget which brother's name it was, but one of them found his money there. Do you know why? Because the first place that Christ was going to be rejected was going to be when he was in the womb of his mother, and Joseph brought him to the hotel. Brought her, excuse me, brought her to the hotel so that she would not have to be out in, in the open fields to deliver her, her child. And they were rejected. Christ was rejected when he was still in the womb at the hotel. The money was placed back there showing you cannot purchase your sins. So I don't care how many indulgences you do, you know, how many misvotes you want to do, that's not redemption. Redemption is paid with a price. So no matter how much the Pharisees of today try to tell you that if you support the, the yeshiva, you do so much you get uh, mitzvot, and they come up with this whole new law system, this oral law system for redemption, it's not redemption. And I don't want to make this too long, but I'll just quickly say this as well. We'll go to this another broadcast for Hebrew Nation Radio one day. I, I love to talk about the story of Joseph. But also, remember when he took... Benjamin finally comes down. He places the cup in Benjamin's bag. Sends them on their way. When they stop them and everything, Benjamin's caught with the cup. Do you know why? Because Christ was rejected by the Benjamites at the communion table. Exactly right. I'm not talking about Judas here. We're talking about, see, the tribe of Benjamin, they were really kind of innocent. The Pharisees, of course, were not from the tribe of Benjamin, but they talked them into this. The point being, though, the cup was in Benjamin's bag. He was not guilty of the sin that was done to his brethren, but he still was found with the cup in his bag. You know, that also shows that God knew over a thousand years later it would be Benjamin's own sons that would betray his brother Joseph. A lot of things you can see in these stories here. Anyway, though, I get so far off here and I'll forget exactly where I'm headed to with all this. So, we see here, God is going to make a new covenant. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for as much as they broke my covenant, although I was the Lord over them, saith the Lord. All right, so this is my whole point. Brother Shapiro, this is my point with you as well. You want to bring believers and put them underneath, not just rabbis, not even a Karaite rabbi, which is under Levitical law, but now you want to put them underneath Talmudic rabbis which is far worse, an oral law. God said he's making a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers 
in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for as much as they broke my covenant, although I was a Lord over them, saith the Lord. But this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law where? In their inward parts. Right? And in their heart will I write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Only Christ Jesus could do that. Yeshua himself, the only one, that could actually make that happen. All right, so let's take a look at the scripture here. We're in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter, the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. All right? Now, watch what the writer of Hebrews says. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Melchizedek. All right, king of righteousness. All right, and he says here, and verily they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. <laughs> In other words, they get to take tithes, but yet the tithe actually belonged to Melchizedek. Not even to the Levites. The Levites were given that permission though. But he whose descendants is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Hmm. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. He liveth. Let me look at that for just a moment here. Genesis chapter 14. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew. Now he dwelt by the terebinths of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Ishkol and brother of Anner, and these were confederate with Abram. Now if you remember, I mentioned this to you guys not long ago, that the Amorites were confederate with Abram. And later in the very next chapter, chapter 15 of Genesis, this is when God says to Abraham, which is called Abram at that time, that the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. Now when I do the message on the trail of the serpent, or the path of the serpent, you're going to discover this has this very point, Melchizedek, this Amorite, this coalition, all this plays in together. Because the iniquity of the Amorite is going to be when the Amorite Later, when Joshua comes into the land and they have now mixed in through witchcraft with the Nephilim, and then when their iniquity is finally full is when the, the Levites will end up marrying in amongst their daughters and their sons, and they end up using that witchcraft to bring forth a bastard-born children, Nephilim children, that end up usurping the, 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 uh, the true... Kohanim priesthood, the Levitical priesthood of Aaron's sons, and they put in their own children instead. The Hasmonean dynasty. So the Pharisees, although not every Pharisee is like this, but that bloodline came down through the iniquity of the Amorite. That's when God brings judgment. And of course, the crushing of the serpent's head, during the times of Yeshua, it wasn't crushed, it was wounded. Now I'm going to be looking more into Revelation as well, is that could be where that deadly wound is, and they revive. The beast is revived. He revives from his deadly wound because he's it's not he's not it wasn't crushed, he was wounded, according to what the scripture says. A wounded Christ heal. Driving that nail is where I believe that is into his feet there. But Christ wounded his head at that time. He exposed who he was. Right? When Abram heard, 
that his brother was taken captive. He led forth his trained men born in his house, 318, and pursued as far as Dan. And he divided himself against them by night and his servants. We know all this, what happens there. And he brought back all the goods, also brought back his brother Lot and his goods and the, and the women also and the people, right? And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at his return from the slaughter of uh, Kedor uh, Lo Loamer and the kings that were with him in the valley of Sheva, the same as the king of the Val. All right, but here's what we got to focus now. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Do you not realize who Melchizedek is? At the time he meets Abraham, is that not Christ? When Christ came to his disciples, he didn't have to bring a lamb. He brought bread and wine. And he was priest of God the Most High. What was he? Kohen. He was a Kohen. He was a priest. Aaron hadn't even been born yet. No wonder why the writer of the book of Hebrews, and I know people say it's Paul, okay, maybe Paul, but there's also an argument that it could be of somebody else. The whole point that I want to make here, though, is as the writer of the book of Hebrews clearly identifies, there ariseth another, there's another priesthood. It was before the Levitical priesthood of Aaron, and that was the priesthood of Melchizedek. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God, Most High, Maker of heaven and earth. Mm. And, and blessed be God the Most High, who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Alright? Now, I mentioned to you though, we were looking at Genesis. I'm sorry, we're in Genesis. We're looking at Hebrews. He's, but he whose descent is not count from them received tithes of Abram, blessed him and had the promise. And with all contradiction, the less is blessed the more. Right? And here the men that die receive tithes, but there receiveth them of him whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Where does that come from, though? From the book of Psalms. All right? Why? The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the manner of Melchizedek. How long is he a priest for? And by the way, that's not plural either. You messianic and, and Talmudic rabbis, that's ata you. Talking about the Mashiach, Kohen, a priest, Leolam. Hmm. And the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Now, see, also the writer of uh, Hebrews makes it clear this is where God swore an oath of the priesthood. No wonder there's an enmity, a hatred between the seed of of the devil and the seed of the woman who are those that by faith believe in God and of course which is Christ Yeshua because see the enmity is they want to keep they want to keep you bound under the law the law was just a schoolmaster he was outside the ark not in the heart right but he's a priest forever after the you know after the order or the manner of Melchizedek. Or the word of Melchizedek. Debarti. Oh, I love, I love the word of God. It's just amazing when we read the word of God. Now, I've got to... Let's see, I, I have everything in here a certain way. So we want to make sure... I, I don't want to miss any of this here. All right. So as I said, there was enmity between the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Right? And they shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise their heel or his heel. He shall bruise his, he uh, his uh, head and you shall bruise his heel. Again, they totally messed this up. 
The Masoretes messed it, or the, or the Talmudic rabbis that put these vowels in here messed it up. And uh, well, that's a different issue altogether. Anyway, but let's get into this enmity issue. Romans. In chapter 8 of the book of Romans, verse 7, one scripture in particular. Because, let me back up just a little bit. That, okay. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You understand now? Carnally minded is keeping laws and ordinances and the washing of pots and pans and all these type things that, that they have out there, whether it be oral law or whether it be Levitical law that was placed outside the ark. All right? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Alright? Now, let's make it more clear. Let's look at it in Ephesians where Paul writes about it. Alright, let me back up a little bit. Let's start with verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. He's talking about the Gentiles. All right. So in this case here, we could agree with, with uh, Brother Shapiro when he said, Israel has to come in first. No Gentile will come in until Israel comes in first. I agree with him if you go back 2,000 years ago. All right? And that's what Paul's saying here too, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. He's right. But now in Christ Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Why? You needed a new covenant. Not by the law, but you needed that law, you needed that covenant by the high priest Melchizedek. After that order. Okay? For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition. And of course they add on there between us. Alright? Now here's the important part having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. You see, it's like when I said to you earlier, it's the Ten Commandments didn't get done away with, they should be in your heart, not on a stone. In your heart you should know not to kill, not to covet your neighbor's wife. You know, I can prove that to you. I can prove to you that that was a scripture that was known in the times of even Abraham. It, Moses hadn't wrote the Ten Commandments. Oh, I'm sure that, you know, the Talmudists would say, that's the Noahide law. No, it was passed down from Adam all the way down, not Noah. Because why? It was a law within their heart. When the king wanted Abraham's wife, if you remember, even before he even asked for her, Abraham said to his wife, Sarah, he says, tell him you're my sister. And I'll tell him I'm your brother. Well, he was technically he was right. They shared the same father, just different mothers. So technically he was right. And when the king, because he said, why? He said, they'll kill me to take you. Why? This ain't, this ain't Noahide law, friend. He knew that he couldn't have her unless her husband was dead. 
Think about that one for a little bit. Right? So the point being, he says, having abolished in his flesh Christ, a Christ abolished what? The enmity, the hatred, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. See, the commandments, where were the commandments at? They were in the ordinances. He's talking about Levitical law. He's talking about oral law. Okay? And we know this because when Yeshua came here, notice there's two things he, he hit on. He hit on Levitical law and on oral law. You want to know how we know? Even though they had not written the Talmud yet, they had not put this oral law into print as of yet. But what did Yeshua said? He said, you make... Mm, I got I got to pull this out here for them, okay? Uh, it's, it's the teaching doctrines for the commandments of man, right? That's that's where we're going to go at. Matthew chapter 15 verse 9. All right? Now, that's one. But that that'll suffice for now. Let's back up Matthew 15 verse 7, and maybe I should put this on the screen for those of you that are watching on Danoon Institute here. Okay, so we go to Matthew 15. And what did we say? Verse 7, I believe it was. We're going to back up just a little bit, though. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father and his mother, he shall be, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of non-effect by your tradition. He's talking about oral law. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And I actually had the wrong verse. What verse was that again? It was verse 9. Okay, so we go back. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. All right? And, of course, he talked about the washing of hands. He gets into that ordinance. But if you remember, there was one Levitical law he brings up. He said, you've heard it said of them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Right? You remember that one there? Now, that's Levitical law is what he talks about there. But what does Yeshua say? That's, that's actually from Exodus and Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 20, Levitical law is where it's at, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and he hath caused a blemish in a man, uh, so shall it be done to him again. Levitical law. Remember uh, Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 20, said God said, he gave, I gave you laws that were not good. And of course in the Talmud, they like to separate those for you. Not good laws and good laws. They got a lot of good laws that should be on the not good law side, right? Exodus 20, 24, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. But Yeshua says in Matthew 5, 38, what did he say there? You have heard that it has been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him with the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Challenging. Levitical law. Alright, so what do we have in the scripture then when we were reading over here uh, just a moment ago in Ephesians? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That was a Levitical law. For to, to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain what? The enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you, which were far off unto them that were, in, were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. It is fulfilled. Jeremiah 31 is fulfilled. So how can we do anything else but, but, to, to, but to keep the word of God, right? Now, 
Let's take you then back, right? This is this the priesthood of Melchizedek was fulfilled in Christ. It is that new covenant. So let's go back then to uh, Hebrews chapter 8, where we left off at, and uh, we'll start with verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by who, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. What are the better promises? The high priest Melchizedek, right? For oh gosh let's let's go for a reminder we don't want to lose this right the Lord has sworn and will not repent thou art a, a priest forever after the manner of Melchizedek let's 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 back up and read a little bit of this now who you are let's let's just a little bit here in adornments of holiness from the womb of the dawn thine is the dew of thy youth so we know that whoever it is are going to be born from the womb the Lord has sworn and will not repent that our priests forever after the manner of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand doth crush kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He filleth it with dead bodies. He crusheth the head over a wide land. He will drink of the brook in the way. Therefore will he lift up the head. Do you realize? I mean, most believers in Christ know that this prophecy is talking about the Mashiach, is talking about the Messiah, and they know it's talking about Christ. When we look at the scripture, and as I said, we see in the book of Genesis when God made the promise in there about the enmity between thee and between the, between thy children. Uh, between uh, I got I got to go back to it real quick here. Okay, we're gonna we're not gonna lose it. Here we go. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. Uh, between, between thy seed and her seed. Alright? In other words, Satan hated the woman. Woman hated Satan for what he did to her. We also see it in Revelation when, when, when Satan, that, that dragon, that serpent, he goes after the woman. God has to hide her in the wilderness. Because she's what? Getting ready to bring forth the man-child. That's not Israel. That's Christ. All John's doing is taking you back through what was going on. But then that hatred, it came down through the law. Then they really perverted it into an oral law. Talmudic law. And so God said there would be enmity not only between the serpent and the woman, but also between Christ, her seed, which is Christ, and of course those that believe upon him, which are Abraham's seed as well, which are innumerable. And the devil's children. And what did Jesus say? You are of your father the devil. And the works of your father you will do. Talking to the Pharisees. And he blasted them for their oral law. And he said, you make the word of God of no effect to yourselves. The enmity, the hatred. And even to this day, there's so much hatred between the two. Those that think you've got to keep the law and those that were saved by grace through Jesus Christ. I believe the Ten Commandments should be in your heart. And that doesn't mean if you got in your car on the Saturday and drove it that you're breaking the Ten Commandments. As Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's a different message altogether I can go into. But I believe that when it's in your heart, you want to rest. When you're in Christ, as the Scripture says, you have ceased from what? Your works. What works? The works of the law. That's what you're to rest from. Because the law said you can't do this. The law says, according to oral law, you have to put on your left shoe first, not tie it, then put on your right shoe afterwards, then go back and tie the left shoe, or vice versa, whichever way that is. Burdens upon the people. And now we, here we are getting ready for the coming of Christ, and the, the hatred is more than ever now. 
If the law, do you ever think about it? God told Moses, write the Ten Commandments on those two tables, right? Two tables of stone, he wrote it on. Your heart has got two sides to it. And in your heart, you can keep that Sabbath. Even if you're honoring the day and you're resting, because as Yeshua said, it was made for man, not man for it. God was trying to give them a day of rest. People just miss it. They miss it. So let's, let's go back. But remember, here, the, the, the wounding of the heel and the wounding of the head, it's a wound. It's not a crushing of the head. Shufcha. Yashufcha Rosh. See, who Yashufcha Rosh, he will wound his head. And you wound his heel. Think about it. But there does come the crushing, as I said, in Psalm 110. I believe this is where it all comes from. Because when he talks about that, when he talks about the one that is going to be born, the one that's going to be born, we know he's going to be born because he comes from the womb of the dawn. <laughs> You know, that's even, oh my God, oh my gosh, do you not realize what he's saying there? This is a compound fulfillment. Thy people offer themselves willingly in the day of thy warfare, in adornments of holiness. From the womb of the dawn, thine is the dew of thy youth. You know what the dawn he really is? Remember now, John says in John 1 and 1 that he came forth to bear record of the light but he was not that light but the light was the light of men right all right so let's just look at it then genesis 1 bereshit bara elohim et hashamay ve et haaretz ve haaretz hayata tohu vevochu ve choshet apanet achum all right and the earth it didn't have any form it was there was it was without it was void it had, and, and darkness apanet achum was upon the face of of, of the deep the Ruach Elohim and the Spirit of God brooded over or hovered over the water or waters, plural. The Yomer Elohim Yahior. And God said, Let there be light. The Yahior. And there was light. See, and what did John say in the Gospel of John? Oh, it's, it's, it's just amazing to me. You know, I, I just, I love the gospel. And sometimes we get away from the gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was what? With God and the Word was God. And the Word was that light, right? Because what did he say? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made in Him was what? Life! Which tells you what also? He was the eighth Chaim. He was the tree of life. And the life was what? The light of men. And the light shineth in what? Darkness. What did it say in Genesis 1? Now the earth was unformed and void. And what? Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Choshek. Like the Nachash kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Choshek, Nachash. Yeah, if you want to get a similitude there, the serpent and the darkness go hand in hand. But not Christ. He's that light. All right? Now, let's go back. Where were we at here? Psalm 110. So he comes from what? From the womb of the dawn. The dawning of the light. Thine is the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the manner of Melchizedek. See, not only the dawning of eternity, but he was also from the womb of his mother Mary. See, there he is. The Lord at thy right hand doth crush kings in the day of his wrath. All right, now, you want to look at the word crushed? Here it is, machatz. There's your word crush. He will judge among the nations. He will fill it there with dead bodies. He crusheth. Okay? Machatz. 
Rosh, singular. He crusheth the head. Okay? He crusheth the head. Now it says over here, over a wide land, upon the earth, Rabbah, which is where they get the wide part because it's a wide expanse. That's when the serpent gets crushed. He will drink of the brook in the way, therefore will he lift up the head. That's when he'll show you. Ah, I, I, this is just absolutely amazing to me. And, and I hope, I don't know if I made this simple enough or not for you, friends, but I hope I have. And somehow, God, please help people to understand what I'm saying. So what, let's just sum it up in the simplicity, the best way I know how. We looked at Hebrews chapter 8. We found out there is a, the, the, for if that first covenant had been faultless, and we'll just say Paul, because I know a lot of people believe as Paul wrote Hebrews, that Paul said there had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. You see, Jeremiah 31 is what, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying, would not have, there would be no need for a new covenant in Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 31 here, and, and or actually verse 30, behold the day, behold uh, the day is coming, saith the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. There would be no need for this if the first covenant was sufficient. That's why when Brother Shapira says you should go back, he tells the Jews down in, I mean the, the Christians, the believers in Yeshua that live down in South America, they need to repent for their father's forsaken Judaism and go back underneath the, the rabbis. You've just rejected the whole premise of the New Covenant. Why? You don't, Brother Shapira, you don't have to go back. If, if anything, you're going back under the law. You're, going, you're taking them back in the enmity that causes the division in the first place. All right? Don't go back under the law. This was all fulfilled. Just like this whole thing about Zechariah. Right? When this is so used so often, uh, and Brother Shapiro has used it as well. A lot of people use this scripture here. I used to use it too. I used to think the same thing. Listen, I'm no different than you guys. We don't all have everything exactly right. Zechariah chapter 8, right? Going to take a hold of the skirt of, a, of him that is a Jew. Well, praise be to God. Take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. And they, say, and they, lo and, and they love to say, they like to quote this part right here. Le mod ne lecha im chem. We will go with you. Ki shamanu Elohim im chem. For God is, for we have heard that God is with you. And they keep saying, the im chem. It's plural, plural, im chem. But you know, when those ten men of the nations take all the wing, that wing is the wing of a man and a Jewish man. Singular. That was Christ. And that ten men of the nations that take a hold, Right there, ten shall take hold out of all the languages of the nation, shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. When you take a hold of Christ, when you take him by the wing, be enough. Then you will fulfill as it was. And of course, the ten men that we already we've gone over this in other videos there, but just for the sake of you, in case you've not heard it before, I'll say it right now to you. In Acts, when when did this all take place? All right, Acts chapter 2, all right? Most people think about, you know, uh, baptism. What must we do to re be baptized, stuff like that? But it was when the devout Jews, right, they had gathered together. They were there on the day of Pentecost. They were there for, the, for, the, for, for that wonderful feast of the Lord. Maybe it's in Acts, or did I go into Acts? No, I went into Genesis, sorry. All right, in Acts chapter 2, right? These devout Jews from all the nations. Here it is. See? Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and confounded. Okay, well, back up a little bit. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. Why devout Jews? Conjecture. I have to put a conjecture here. I believe, because as it's still held to to this day in Israel, they believe that there's ten 
righteous Jews praying at the wall in Jerusalem or any city they're in, God will spare the city according to what he promised Abraham when he was going to destroy the city uh, that Sodom and Gomorrah was in because of the sins. And Abraham gets all the way down to ten. If there's ten righteous, would you spare it for the sake of the ten? He will spare a city for the sake of ten. The man won't, but God will. Right? But in that case there, that's why I believe it says devout Jews. Not only were they religious, but they were from all, every nation under heaven. They were in Jerusalem. They were there. Why? For the, for the Feast of Passover. And of course, they, it names all the nations that were known at that time where they were from. That's when they took a hold of him that is a Jew. That's when they said they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Now the ones that were mocking were the Pharisees. These men are full of new wine. But Peter standing up, lifted up and his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing as but at the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. See? Then they wanted to be baptized. What is it? We have heard God is with you. The plural was from that 120 that came out of the upper room. And also remember too, the scripture says that though the seed of though, though Abraham's seed be as the sand of the seashore, only a remnant would return. Don't forget Jesus also, he said to his apostles, I am sent only unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he commanded them to go out. Before this ever happened, he commanded them to go out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why do you think they were gathered there during that time? These, they were not just Jews. These are Judeans. That word in, in the Greek language is Judeans. Devout Judeans. Because their ancestry was from Israel. That's where it is. I trust this has been a blessing to you, this message. If you'd like to support the work we do here, whether you're listening on Hebrew Nation Radio, the Noon Institute, Israeli News Live, please help us. Support the work we do. We're here to tell you the truth. We cover all kinds of things on our news channel. We really get into some controversial things, but we're trying to help people. You can donate if you would like via our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. We have a link on there where you can just click on there and donate. I'll also put a link in the description below here. So you can just click on the link right directly out of the, the video. Uh, also, our, our address will be in the description below as well as on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. We thank you. And a lot of times, too, you can see our address right there at the base of the screen there. Uh, so... We trust it's a blessing for you. I'm Stephen Benoon, Denoon Institute, Biblical Research, Identifying the Messiah. Shalom.